Welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today, let us discuss the important news appearing in the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 20th March 2020. The news to be discussed has been presented on the screen and timestamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. So let's start our today's discussion. And the first news to be discussed appears on the editorial section on page number 10. It says, drastic but necessary. Speakers must realize that deliberate inaction on defection matters and is no more an option. Now this editorial highlights that the Supreme Court's decision of stripping a Manipur minister of entering his office and also barring him from entering the state legislative assembly may appear drastic and unusual but is quite a reasonable and necessary course of action considering his case of defection being pending before the Speaker of Manipur Legislative Assembly. Further, the Supreme Court has also ruled that such cases of anti-defection cannot be delayed and must be disposed of within a reasonable period of time. Thus, effectively this editorial deals with the case of anti-defection being delayed by the Speaker of Manipur Legislative Assembly. And this editorial mentions that this decision of Supreme Court is quite reasonable considering the lapse of time to decide cases of anti-defection by the Speaker of Manipur Legislative Assembly and accordingly the Supreme Court has not entered into the territory of Speaker of Manipur Legislative Assembly. Now this topic becomes very important both from our prelims as well as from our mains perspective as Questions can be asked in your GS paper 2 in your mains examination and also questions may be asked with respect to powers of speaker under the Indian constitution in your prelims examination of 2020. So in this backdrop, let us understand the background of this case, the Supreme Court decisions. Now here there are two aspects of Supreme Court decisions. First is a prior decision and the second is a present decision whereby the Supreme Court has invoked Article 142 of the Indian Constitution. So in this regard, we shall also go through the important highlights of the prior decision and also about the present decision whereby the Supreme Court has invoked Article 142 of the Indian Constitution. Now according to this particular case, BJP lawmaker and Manipur Forest Minister Shama Kumar was initially in BJP. but he fought and won election on the ticket from Indian National Congress. And after winning the election on the ticket of Indian National Congress, he again joined BJP. And this led to the case of anti-defection before the Speaker of Manipur Legislative Assembly. Now this case of anti-defection before the Manipur Legislative Assembly took place in 2017. But the matter was never decided by the Speaker of Manipur Legislative Assembly. And accordingly, a petition was filed in the Supreme Court of India under the name of Kesham Mek Chandra Singh vs Union of India. And the petition sought disqualification of the Forest Minister of Manipur, Shyama Kumar, under the 10th Schedule of the Indian Constitution as the 10th Schedule deals with anti-defection law. So it is in this regard, we are discussing about the two judgments, that is the prior judgment and the present judgment. Whereby in the prior judgment, the Supreme Court had asked the Speaker of Manipur Legislative Assembly to decide this case of anti-defection within a period of four weeks. Further, the Supreme Court also held that if the case is not decided within four weeks, then it will be open for the Supreme Court to decide disqualification of the candidate concerned. So accordingly, even as per the prior judgment, Supreme Court gave enough opportunity to the Speaker of Manipur Legislative Assembly to do his job with respect to deciding case of anti-defection under the 10th schedule of the Indian constitution. Now in this very important judgment, the Supreme Court, while giving this judgment, highlighted some of the important role and function of the Speaker with respect to legislative assemblies as well as Speaker of Lok Sabha in cases of anti-defection. So in this backdrop, let us go through those important highlights which have been observed by the Supreme Court with respect to functions of speaker while deciding the case of anti-defection. Now the first and important point here is that the decision of speaker with respect to anti-defection operates independently from the functioning of the house, either of Lok Sabha or of state legislative assembly. So it says that the decision of the speaker under paragraph 6 of the 10th schedule of the Indian constitution is not the decision of the house, neither it is subjected by the approval of the house. Thus, the decision of speaker or anti-defection 
operates independently from the functioning of the house. Now the second important point highlighted by the Supreme Court was that, that the decision of the speaker is not immune from judicial review whereas the immunity is only from parliamentary procedure. So the court held that the term proceedings in parliament attracts immunity from mere irregularities of procedure and not on the final decision of the speaker or chairman with respect to deciding cases of anti-defection. So the Supreme Court observed that decision of speaker on anti-defection can be judicially reviewed and only the procedure followed cannot be judicially reviewed. However, an important point noted by the Supreme Court was that, that judicial review cannot be available at a stage prior to the making of a decision by the speaker or chairman. So accordingly, in cases of anti-defection, first the speaker or the chairman has to decide the case. However, with respect to Manipur Legislative Assembly, the case is a bit different as the speaker has abdicated from his duty or not decided the case of anti-defection over the last three years and accordingly the Supreme Court has asked the speaker to decide the case of anti-defection within a reasonable period of time. Now third important point highlighted by the Supreme Court is that the decision of speaker with respect to anti-defection performs as a quasi-judicial authority. The Supreme Court said that the speaker or the chairman acting under paragraph 6.1 of the 10th schedule is a tribunal and speaker is a quasi-judicial authority who is required to take a decision within a reasonable period of time. So both these aspects become important. The fact that the speaker or the chairman acts as a quasi-judicial authority and the decision must be given or must be taken within a reasonable period of time. Fourth important point observed by the Supreme Court was that the decision of the speaker with respect to anti-defection is a judicial power. It says that the power to resolve such disputes vested in the speaker or chairman is a judicial power. The fifth point is with respect to blanket ban of judicial review. Now we have already mentioned that judicial review is applicable even on decision of speaker on cases of anti-defection and there is no blanket ban of judicial review on such decision with respect to disqualification under 10th schedule. So here by the Supreme Court observed that judicial review to High Court as well as Supreme Court is allowed on Speaker's decision of disqualification under 10th schedule on grounds of infirmities based on violation of constitutional mandates, malafides, that is decision taken in bad faith, non-compliance of rules and also not following the rules of natural justice. So if a speaker's decision can be said to have all these defects, then the Supreme Court or the High Court has the power of judicial review with respect to cases of anti-defection under 10th schedule of the Indian Constitution. And lastly, the Supreme Court observed that the speaker must decide the case in a reasonable period of time. And this reasonable period of time was decided as three months in the famous judgment of Kihota Holohan versus Zachilu. The court said that the period of three months has been kept in mind considering the life of Lok Sabha and state legislative assemblies which is five years. Further, the Supreme Court also observed that if a person has incurred disqualification then such person does not deserve to be MP or MLA even for a single day. And this point was observed in the prior judgment of Rajendra Singh Rana case. So these form some of the important highlights of the judgment of Kesham Mekchandra case. Now in this present judgment, the Supreme Court also gave certain suggestions as well as recommendation with respect to functioning of speaker as a quasi-judicial authority while deciding cases of anti-defection. So the first point observed by the Supreme Court was that, that there is always a likelihood of bias and such likelihood of bias cannot be ruled out. Now this likelihood of bias according to the Supreme Court results from Article 93 and Article 178 of the Indian Constitution. Now according to Article 93, it mentions about the Speaker and Deputy Speaker of the House of the People whereby it says that the House of the People that is Lok Sabha shall as soon as may be choose two members of the House to be respectively Speaker as well as Deputy Speaker. So both the Speaker and Deputy Speaker have to be members of Lok Sabha and generally the ruling government appoints one of its MPs as speaker as well as deputy speaker. So there is always an element of bias while deciding cases of anti-defection of those MPs from the ruling party. Similarly article 178 says that every legislative assembly of a state shall choose two members of the assembly to be 
respectively as speaker and deputy speaker thereof so even the speaker and deputy speaker of legislative assembly of a state are also chosen from among the mlas so here also the element of bias does exist with respect to the decision of speaker on deciding cases of anti defection now supreme court made another very important suggestion whereby it said that such decision of speaker to decide cases of anti defection must be transferred to a permanent tribunal which is headed by retired supreme court judge or retired chief justice of high court or to some other independent mechanism to decide such cases impartially so the whole observation of supreme court while giving this recommendation of permanent tribunal that these cases of anti defection must be decided impartially it is here where the supreme court observed that the speaker continues to belong to a particular party and there is inherent bias in their ruling so to remove such bias it is necessary that a permanent tribunal shall hear these cases of anti defection under 10 schedule and thereby giving more teeth to the provision contained in the 10 schedule which are very vital for the proper functioning of our democracy so the supreme court favored for a permanent tribunal to hear cases of anti defection and such permanent tribunal according to the supreme court must be headed by a retired supreme court judge or a retired chief justice of high court now another important observation of the supreme court was that these cases of anti defection must be made or must be given on the principles of natural justice and one of the important principles of natural justice is that one should not be a judge in their own case and this is here where the observation of a permanent tribunal becomes important so after understanding the important highlights of this case as well as the background to this case let us go through the important aspects as mentioned in this editorial whereby it says that is the judiciary entering into speaker's shoes while giving these decisions now it's important to note that even after so much of lapse of time the supreme court has only invoked article 142 of the indian constitution and has disallowed shama kumar from using his office and also entering state legislative assembly of manipur so the supreme court even after such delay has accepted that it is the responsibility of the speaker of legislative assembly to decide these cases of anti defection and accordingly has again asked the speaker to decide these cases within a reasonable time frame further the supreme court has also observed that the speaker cannot postpone the petition indefinitely and if the speaker does not decide within a reasonable time frame then the supreme court then has to decide this case of anti defection and if supreme court decide this case of anti defection that it will also amount to abdication of constitutional duty by the speaker of manipur legislative assembly so accordingly the supreme court in the first instance gave the speaker of manipur legislative assembly 4 weeks to decide this case so now after a lapse of 4 week the supreme court itself has not decided the case of anti defection and has again asked the speaker of manipur legislative assembly to decide the case however supreme court has invoked article 142 of the indian constitution to disallow shama kumar from using his office and also entering the state legislative assembly of manipur now here in this regard it's important to know about article 142 of the indian constitution as a question has been asked in upsc prelims of 2019 article 142 mentions about enforcement of decrees and orders of supreme court and orders as to discovery it says the supreme court in the exercise of its jurisdiction may pass such decree or make such order as is necessary for doing complete justice in any cause or matter pending before it and this was the question asked in the prelims of 2019 the question was with reference to the constitution of india prohibitions or limitations or provisions contained in ordinary laws cannot act as prohibition or limitations on the constitutional powers under article 142 it could mean which one of the following here the correct answer was b that the supreme court of india is not constrained in the exercise of its powers by laws made by the parliament so we understand that supreme court has invoked article 142 in several of the previous judgments and accordingly article 142 becomes important so accordingly in this judgment let us wait for the final decision of speaker of manipur legislative assembly with case of anti defection of shama kumar as mentioned that this topic becomes important both from the perspective of prelims and your mains examination with respect to powers and functions of speaker of lok sabha and state legislative assembly also with respect to deciding cases of anti defection 
The next news appears as a lead article on page number 10. It says, Giving Human Rights Commissions More Teeth. The Madras High Court is to decide whether the recommendations made by such panels are binding upon the state. Now, this lead article highlights that National and State Human Rights Commission formed under the Protection of Human Rights Act of 1993 are toothless institutions as they function in mere advisory capacity and the government is free to disobey or even disregard their observations as well as findings. So there are two aspects. First, the advisory nature of state and national human rights commission which are constituted or formed under the protection of human rights act of 1993 and also the fact that a case has been pending before a full bench of madras high court which will ultimately decide that whether the recommendation given by these commissions are actually binding on the government or not binding. now the author also mentions that national and state human rights commission also functions as a fourth branch institution and also the fact that these commissions have power of civil court and hence in this regard the author believes that the commission's reports and recommendations must be binding on the government. Now this topic becomes important from the perspective of polity and governance in your prelims examination and from your mains perspective gets covered under GS paper 2 specifically with respect to powers and functions of regulatory and statutory bodies. Now section 18 of Protection of Human Rights Act mentions about steps during and after inquiry. It says the commission may take any of the following steps during or upon completion of an inquiry held as per this act. So if the inquiry conducted by the commission points out any violation of human rights or negligence in prevention of violation of human rights or abatement thereof by a public servant, then in such instances the Human Rights Commission may recommend to the concerned government or authority these following steps first to make payment of compensation or damages to the complainant or to the victim or the members of his family as the commission may think necessary to initiate proceedings for prosecution or such other suitable action as the commission may deem fit or to take such further action as it thinks fit so the question before madras high court is that whether this recommendation of the commission under section 18 of the protection of human rights act is either binding in nature or either non-binding on the state as well as central government now this article highlights that the state and national human rights commission also functions as a fourth branch institution and also has the power of civil court with respect to judicial proceedings so in this regard, let us go through some of the functions as well as powers of state and national human rights commission with respect to conduct of any inquiry against violation of human rights. Now it highlights that NHRC can inquire suo moto that is by itself or on a petition presented to it by any victim or any person on his behalf or on a direction or order of any court with respect to complaints related to violation of human rights or abatement thereof or negligence in the prevention of such violation by a public servant. Thus basically the Human Rights Commission can initiate an inquiry by their own with respect to violation of human rights against any person in the country. Further these Human Rights Commission can also intervene in any proceedings involving any allegation of violation of human rights pending before a court with the approval of such court. They also have the power to visit any jail or other institution under the control of state government where such persons are detained or lost for the purpose of treatment, reformation or protection for the study of living conditions of these people. Further, the commission also has power to review the safeguards provided with respect to violation of human rights under the constitution or any other law in the country. Next, the commission also has right to study treaties and other international instruments on human rights and also make recommendations with respect to their effective implementation to the state authority. Now again the question of recommendations comes into picture that is whether these recommendations are either binding in nature or non-binding in nature. Further the commission also has a right to undertake and promote research in the field of human rights spreading human rights literacy among various sections of the society and also promotion of awareness with respect to safeguards available in order to protect human rights of individuals in the country. Now with respect to powers of inquiry and investigation, 
the commission shall have the power to inquire into any case and accordingly shall have the power of a civil court so with respect to violation of human rights against any individuals the commission can summon the witness in order to examine them on oath the commission can ask for discovery and production of any document before it the commission can receive any evidence on affidavits the commission can order for requisition of any public record or copy from any court or office of the government and also the commission can order for examination of witness or document submitted before it so accordingly we can see that the commission has certain judicial functions as well as powers with respect to summoning of evidences and accordingly human rights commission can act as a fourth branch institution as it has powers of a civil court further the author highlights that human rights commission acts as a body between individuals and state authorities and its task is to ensure its constitutional commitment in order to protect human rights of individuals in the country so according to the author human rights commission has the powers of civil court and proceedings before it are deemed to be judicial proceedings and this provides strong reasons for its findings to be treated at the very least as quasi judicial body so the author says that the human rights commissions must be considered as a quasi judicial body and accordingly as per the rules of law the decisions of quasi judicial bodies are binding in nature so the author believes that it is this aspect which the madras high court will look into now this article has mentioned about the fourth branch institution and has divided into two categories namely constitutional bodies and statutory or regulatory bodies the constitutional bodies includes election commission comptroller and auditor general as well as sc st and obc commission whereas with respect to statutory bodies or such bodies formed or constituted through an act of parliament includes information commission competition commission sebi human rights commission etc so this author concludes by saying that since the commission has power of a civil court and also functions as a fourth branch institution hence this aspect must be looked into while deciding the case by the full bench of madras high court now since the matter is sub juris so let us wait for the final verdict of the madras high court now this topic becomes important with respect to the national and state human rights commission formed under the protection of human rights act of 1993 and questions can be asked in your upcoming prelims examination of 2020 so with this discussion let's move on to our next news analysis the next news appears on page number 11 in the article section it says need for reorientation state universities will have to deliver more to the state where they are located now this article mentions about poor state of state universities in india and accordingly discusses the problems as well as challenges of state universities with respect to its central counterpart that is the central university now in this regard you must understand that education has been provided under the concurrent list of seventh schedule of the indian constitution and accordingly both the center as well as state can have their respective universities however in india there are more state universities as compared to central universities and also the fact that central universities are better funded as compared to its state counterpart so in this regard let us go through the problems as well as challenges with respect to these state universities compared to its central counterpart now this topic of state universities and higher education becomes an important topic with respect to the concept of education in gs paper 2 specifically with respect to aspect of social issues or social justice now these state and central universities are regulated by the university grant commission and this is done through the university grants commission act of 1956 it says then an act to make provision for the coordination and determination of standards in universities and for that purpose it establishes a university grants commission now this act defines a university as a university means a university established or incorporated by or under a central act a provincial act or a state act so we understand that universities as per the ugc act includes both central as well as state universities now the role of state universities in india is very important as the total number of degrees awarded by the state universities are as high as 90% considering the fact that there are only 40% of state universities in india 
Now another problem with state universities is that their share in total research publication is mere 33 percent. So for a state university to improve its quality of education it needs more funding in R&D that is research and development so that its total research publication increases beyond 33 percent. Now some of the reasons as provided by this author with respect to problems of state universities are first it ranks poor in institutional rankings students have low employability rate who graduate from these state universities further most of these publications do not make any significant impact and are not published in peer-reviewed journals further people belonging to state universities across india have negligible presence in national as well as state level policy decision making bodies and also they get less recognition or awards as compared to its central counterpart. So these are some of the problems with respect to state universities as highlighted in this article. Now these challenges include government and political interference in their management which results in lack of autonomy for these state universities. Further, these state universities also suffer from poor governance structures, poor quality of teachers and also poor infrastructures. And this is also because of the fact of lack of recruitment of quality teachers in these state universities. Further, these state universities also receive very less funding from the state government and this overall impacts their research and developmental activities or capabilities. Another challenge highlighted by this author is with respect to outdated syllabus used in most of the state universities and also with respect to plagiarism in these state universities. Now the maximum number of cases of plagiarism is reported from India but hardly any strict action is taken by the government on this behalf. Now the challenges faced by central universities are comparatively less as compared to challenges faced by state universities and these are mostly because of ecosystem as well as location of these central universities such as IITs, Mumbai University, JNU, Delhi Universities etc. Now here it is important to understand that any university does not operate or function in a vacuum and it functions in an interconnected world. So it's important for universities to interact with different sections of the society including government organizations as well as industries or business. And because of the presence of these central universities over a period of time with respect to their interaction with these different institutions such as government, industries, business, even social institutions such as NGOs, etc. make the interaction of central universities and its students much more organic as compared to state universities. And it is here where the state universities lack with respect to interaction with the society members. And it is because of these aspects author highlights that central universities are never short of funds, not because of the fact that they receive ample fund from center, but also because of the fact of their interaction with different institutions of the society such as government, industries, business, intelligentsia as well as different other social or political organizations. Further, these central universities have stronger alumni as compared to the state universities and these stronger alumni are placed at important positions in the government, at industrial level and even in various multinational companies and organizations including NGOs. And this alumni of these central universities makes this interaction with the university much more easier as compared to interaction of these state universities and their alumni. So this ecosystem is lacking with respect to state universities. So the author says that the state universities needs to create such an ecosystem or a state system similar to what exists for central universities and for this the state universities have to increase their access to other section of the society. So one of the challenge for these state universities as highlighted by the author is lack of access to various institutions both public as well as private and this is also because of the fact that no stakeholder either at the political level in a state, business level in a state or educational level in a state want to invest in state universities because they find no value addition. So state universities in order to increase their access and also to receive more fund apart from the government have to show more promise in terms of delivering which becomes beneficial to these different organizations 
including political, business, as well as educational system or educational institutions. So the author concludes by saying that the state university need to create a similar interaction with the state system which exists for the central universities and they also have to increase their access to other sections of the society both public and private as well as political, business, educational or any other sections of the society. Now as already highlighted that this topic of education becomes important from the perspective of GS paper 2 and this topic must be understood from a mains perspective. With this, let's move on to our next topic of discussion. The next news to be discussed appears on page number 15. It says, Rupee breaches 75 to a dollar, hits record low. Bond yields harden despite open market operation plan. Now, according to this news, because of global economic slowdown, as well as with the result of outbreak of coronavirus or COVID-19 virus, it has resulted in flight of capital. Now, flight of capital basically refers to outflow of money from developing countries to developed countries. That is from less secured location to more secured location. And this flight of capital has also impact Indian rupee as it has depreciated to a new low of rupee 75 as compared to $1. Now, with respect to India, it has been observed that FPIs worth over $10 billion have been sold. Now, foreign portfolio investors or FPIs are such foreign companies who invest in Indian securities, that is, in the Indian share market with respect to shares, bonds, equity, etc. So, whatever they had invested in India, they have taken their investment out of India and invested in a more secured location. That is, mostly these investments have been gone to United States of America. And this has overall resulted in appreciation of US dollars and also depreciation of Indian rupee. So in this regard, let us understand about depreciation of rupee, its causes as well as its effect. So the question is, what is rupee depreciation? Now rupee depreciation in very plain terms means decrease in the value of rupee as compared to other currencies. Now this can be understood through an example. Suppose earlier the value of $1 was rupee 65. And now the value of dollar has become rupees 70. So we mean that we have to pay rupees 5 more to have 1 dollar. And this means that rupee has depreciated as compared to dollar. So it says that as shown in the example, due to the change in the exchange rate, one would be required to pay rupees 5 more to get the same dollar. Hence, the value of dollar is said to have appreciated, whereas the value of rupee is said to have depreciated. Now this depreciation of rupees has several impacts on export as well as import. Now as we have already seen that increase in dollar outflow puts more pressure on Indian rupee and continuous outflow of dollars results in rupee depreciation. So increase in dollar outflow also means decrease in dollar inflow. And this also impacts import as well as export. Now with respect to imports and exports, imports become expensive whereas it benefits the exporters. Now the reason being to import one dollar, earlier you had to pay rupees 65. But now to import value of one dollar, we have to pay rupees 5 extra. And this makes the import expensive. Whereas for exporters, Export of goods worth one dollar earns the exporters rupees five more. So when rupee depreciates, exports become beneficial. Now depreciation of Indian rupee also impacts balance of trade as well as current account. Now this is because of the fact that India is a import driven economy. So we have more import as compared to exports. So whatever gain there are in exports, it is offset by extra cost paid through import and hence it also impacts the current account deficit. So it says that India is majorly import dependent country. Hence costlier imports adversely affect the trade balance and hence it leads to widening of current account deficit. Now more import also impact inflation in the economy. 
now it highlights that higher value of imported goods drives up the inflation rate now this means that more import makes the goods costly in the indian market and this overall increases inflation in the economy and this leads to import driven or import led inflation and even according to rbi's report 5% depreciation of the currency will add 15 basis points to domestic inflation so when the rupee is depreciating then in such instances more imports lead to inflation in the economy now such depreciation of rupee also impact india's forex reserves and rbi intervenes in the forex market in order to reduce volatility in the exchange rate now more fluctuations in exchange rate resulting in depreciation of rupee makes the rbi sells dollars so effectively we can say that rbi sells dollars to counter rupee depreciation and selling of more dollars to counter rupee depreciation overall leads to decrease in volume of india's forex reserves now the next impact is with respect to impact on external commercial borrowings now external commercial borrowing refers to an instrument used in india and this facilitates indian company to raise money outside india in foreign currency so the government of india permits indian corporates and companies to raise money through this route namely the external commercial borrowing route for expansion of existing capacity as well as for fresh investments so basically ecb is a type of loan taken in foreign currency by indian corporates now depreciation of rupee also impacts raising of loan through external commercial borrowing as the cost of borrowing goes up when money depreciates so even during rupee depreciation the cost of borrowing goes up for external commercial borrowing so these can be said to be the impact of rupee depreciation on indian economy now all these topics become important from the perspective of your prelims examination as question can be asked in your upcoming prelims of 2020 now after a discussion these forms your practice question for the day question number 1 which of the following can be said to be the impact of rupee depreciation options are number 1 raising loan through ecb becomes cheap no the statement is incorrect as it becomes expensive import becomes expensive yes this is correct depletes forex reserves yes this is also correct so the question is select the correct answer using the code given below so here the correct answer is 2 and 3 that is b question number 2 consider the following statements first university grant commission determines standards of education in central and state universities yes this statement is correct as per the university grant commission act second education has been mentioned in the concurrent list under seven schedule yes this statement is also correct so the question is which of the statements given above is are correct so the correct answer is c that is both 1 and 2 question number 3 which of the following statements about national human right commission is are correct statement 1 it is constituted under the protection of human rights act 1993 yes this statement is correct second its recommendations are binding on the government no the statement is incorrect third it has a power of civil court to summon witness for examination on oath yes this statement is also correct question is select the correct answer using the code given below in this the correct answer is a that is 1 and 3 only now moving on to the question for the day now question for today is consider the following statements statement 1 speaker of lok sabha must be a member of house of the people statement 2 decision of speaker of lok sabha in cases of anti defection is final and cannot be judicially reviewed statement 3 speaker of lok sabha while deciding cases of anti defection functions as a quasi judicial authority so the question is which of the statements given above is are correct options are 1 and 2 only 1 and 3 only 2 and 3 only and d 1 2 and 3 only now coming to the answer of yesterday the question was which of the following ensures judicial independence in india options are unified judiciary mode of appointment and removal of judges in this the correct answer is c that is 2 and 